Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ryan Morrow, the National Security Analyst for the Clarion Project. Thanks for joining us for this very special webinar that really couldn't have come at a more important time. The aftermath of the Boston bombings, moderate Muslims speak out against the Islamic extremists. In response to the bombings in Boston, we have made our hit film, The Third Jihad, available for free on our website, clarionproject.org. And we did this because the bombers were a product. They were a product of the Islamist ideology. And today we have two courageous Muslims speaking out against the Islamist ideology and their efforts to defeat the Islamists. Salim Mansour is an associate professor of political science at the University of Western Ontario. He is the author of Islam's Predicament, Perspectives of a Dissident Muslim. He is also an official with various Muslim organizations. C. Holland Taylor is the CEO of the Lib for All Foundation and an expert on the Islamization process. He established Lib for All in December 2003 with his close friend and one of my personal heroes, former president of Indonesia, Abdurrahman Wahid. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Thank Great to be with you, Ryan. Thank you. All right, let me start with Holland. Holland, as an expert in the radicalization process, what do you think we need to learn from the bombings in Boston? First, this problem is not going away anytime soon. Second, we need to be rational and we need to be clear-headed in understanding and responding to the causes of the bombings in uh, Boston. And clearly this occurred because the individuals involved uh, became exposed to a virulent supremacist hateful ideology which led them to believe that they as Muslims uh, were at war with anyone, not only anyone who uh, was not Muslim, but anyone who did not share their interpretation of Islam. And this problem cannot be solved uh, by fantasy, it cannot be solved by physical force, it has to be solved by transforming Muslims' understanding of Islam from uh, a religion of hatred, supremacism, and violence to one of uh, in which one feels that one's personal obligation is to share God's love and compassion with all humanity and with all creatures. And this already exists within the Muslim world. The reason why most Muslims do not commit terrorist acts is not merely a lack of dynamism, but rather because most Muslims throughout the world do have a pluralistic, tolerant, and spiritual understanding of Islam, but it is not which, what comes to the surface, and also it's traditional rather than funded by the Saudi Wahhabi Muslim Brotherhood juggernaut, which has been on a tear not only since the uh, founding of the Muslim Brotherhood in 28 or the Saudi conquest of Mecca and Medina in 25, but <clears throat> uh, particularly since the 1970s and the vast financial resources that have been available to radicalize Muslims. Muslim populations worldwide since the 1970s. All right, now, Salim, I'm going to give you a chance uh, to respond to that. But also, if you could just incorporate the fact that you live in Canada, we're hearing about Canadians joining the jihad in Syria, and just the other day, two were arrested for a plot to derail a train that was going from New York to Toronto, and the cell was connected to an al-Qaeda network in Iran. So if you could respond to what we as Americans need to learn uh, from the Boston bombings, and also what the situation is like in Canada right now in terms of radical Islam, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, all of what Holland said, I concur with it, you know, I mean, there is a historical and cultural and political background that we need to be more and more conversant in an understanding about it. I mean, this is now, what, 12 years after 9-11, and it seems that, you know, we keep going over and over again over the same thing, and we are in some ways um, not willing to confront the reality. The reality is that there is a global jihad going on, and, and this global jihad is being carried out by a, a a movement within Islam, um, I will call it an aberrant movement, um, but it is a movement which is very strong. Uh, it has state support uh, with very powerful actors. Saudi Arabia has been mentioned, and in some ways, Saudi Arabia is the principal actor. There is Iran, and then there are allies of these actors uh, in Pakistan, now the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, and across North Africa. So these are very powerful actors, and 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 they have to be seriously taken account of. Now, uh, in terms of uh, what happened in Boston, and, and you have alluded to what's been happening in Canada this past month, has been a very troubled time in Canada as we have been confronted with the reality of what uh, is homegrown terrorism or homegrown Islamist terrorism, as I would say, is that the global jihad 
Jihad's local cells. Uh, the global jihad doesn't exist somewhere in the abstract in the stratosphere. It is located right in our community, and, and this jihad is very much present in the West, in Canada, in the United States. And we have to recognize that the people engaged in this jihad uh, are incubated in the environment in which they are living in, in this, in this context, in Canada, in our cities. I mean, there is this, uh, London connection that was disclosed earlier on this month where we had four young um, uh, um, Canadian, uh, two of them of Arab background, Arab origin, uh, and um, uh, two were converts, one from Greek background, one from a Korean background, who ended up as part of the Al-Qaeda North Africa uh, a movement attacking the Algerian gas plant deep in the heart of Sahara. Two of them were killed. One is in prison. One is uh, been tracked down, but we don't know precisely what his connections are. And even as that story was breaking uh, earlier this month, um, then there came the news of a bombing in Somalia, Mogadishu, and again uh, a, a Canadian. Uh, of Somali origin, a young man growing up in Toronto, going to university in Toronto, was identified as one of the uh, suicide bombers. And before we had absorbed that news, that the Canadian population had absorbed that news, we then were informed soon after the bomb Boston bombing of the plot to um, blow up a via rail passenger train between uh, Toronto and uh, um, uh, New York with uh, two um, Muslims, one of Tunisian background and one of Palestinian background. And, and these are simply, uh, again, um, stories and events happening, which is a confirmation of what we now know since 9-11. Uh, Canada is part of the front of the global jihad. The question is, how is this happening? And that is, again, an, uh, another set of uh, discussion that we might get into. <clears throat> right, and that's actually going to be my next question, just going back to Holland. You know, how does this radicalization process even begin? How come you two individuals turn out so different? And how come someone that can seem to be so assimilated into American society and into Western beliefs suddenly become radicalized so quickly? Where does that begin? There was a <clears throat> book that was written by a man named James Billington, uh, the late 70s, professor at Princeton, expert on communism. The title of his book was Fire in the Minds of Men. And he traced the origins and history and development of communism. <clears throat> and the question is, how did somebody become a communist radical? <laughs> and the title of his book, I think, was very revealing because this was not a fire in the hearts of men. <laughs> when there's a fire in the hearts of men and women, it's usually the fire of love. <laughs> but when there is an idea that infects someone's mind, and then it connects to a heart which is not fully open and where even the playing on the heart, because if you look at the videos that were uh, being disseminated by the older brother in the Boston bombings from Syria, it was ostensibly playing on the hearts of Muslims because of the sense of victimology. But <clears throat> it's a sense that where there's an anger that arises and a mental justification for that anger. And in this sense, uh, it I would say that it arises from, and the, the Muslim leaders that we work with at Lipfro Foundation and our International Institute of Quranic Studies, uh, there's a gentleman named Mustafa Bisri who currently runs the world's largest Muslim organization, President Wahid's organization, the Nadatu Ulama. They have 50 million followers and 14,000 madrasas. And the majority of those Muslims who belong to this organization, the Nadatul are, are pluralistic and tolerant. They're not part of this virus. What they believe is that uh, people who are radical Muslims generally have read the Quran, maybe the first chapter, what they say, the first chapter, the second chapter, the third chapter. They've read the chapter on anger. They've read the chapter on retribution, but they've failed to read further to come to the chapter on love. <laughs> in the chapter on understanding, on the chapter on respectful communication, and the chapter on forgiveness and compassion. And so <clears throat> this, and generally in terms of radicalization, it's been our experience working in this field for many years that people who become radicalized generally begin with a very shallow understanding of Islam. The 
it was a joke in Arabic, the Muslim Brotherhood is the Brotherhood of Engineers. Uh, they tend to be scientists and doctors. They do not tend to be ulama, and they certainly are not spiritual ulama. And <clears throat> so you've got a situation where people have, do not have a mature spiritual understanding of Islam. They do not understand the depths of intellectual and spiritual tradition that exist within Muslim societies around the world and the, in the Islamic tradition. But instead, they come with a shallow background. They get exposed to certain ideas, and then their their nature as a human being may predispose them. Because what also very often happens, the Muslim Brotherhood organization, the head, one of the heads of it in Indonesia, is on record as saying, we are the generation who owes nothing to those who come before us because we have the perfect understanding of Islam now. And those who came before us don't understand. And this is a very common phenomenon. It's a rebellion against tradition. And this is something that's often not understood in the West, that there is actually the Wahhabism and the Muslim Brotherhood, it's in line with one tradition within Islam, namely the tradition of supremacism and violence and expansionary imperialistic jihad. It is in, in line with that tradition, but it is completely opposed to the spiritual traditions which have actually enlivened Muslim communities and made life worth living in Muslim societies uh, for the past 1400 years. Right, and I think that's an excellent point. I've noticed that, that a lot of people that are radicalized into carrying out terrorist attacks. They do study engineering, and they're not studying religion, and they're not particularly devout, and they, they get absorbed into the ideology very quickly. Um, and I've always found that to be a very interesting phenomenon. Now, Salim, uh, what would you have to say about that? Well, Holland uh, I mentioned a book. Uh, let me begin by following Holland. I'll mention a book uh, for your audience. Um, Ed Hussein, uh, book Ed Hussein, uh, uh, um, Bangla Bengali or Bangladeshi, uh, born in England, uh, grown up in London, um, uh, in England, went to school there, went to university there, uh, became deeply, deeply uh, indoctrinated and involved in with one of the most extreme uh, Islamist movement uh, in England as a young man. And, and and participated in their activity in their in their doctrinal work and their propaganda etc etc until after the calamity of 9/11 and then the transition in his life you know of completely repudiating all that he had been brought up in and he wrote this wonderful book called the Islamists and and that should be a required reading in trying to understand I mean there are many other books but here is one from a Muslim uh, again in the West. I would say that there are two um, two realities, and we must not conflate those two realities. We must try to maintain, uh, in terms of our understanding, and then that's what we are striving to do. I believe in this webinar uh, of the phenomena of Islamism, and not conflate them. There is a reality of Muslims living in the West that is in the most advanced part. Of, of the of the world community in in the 21st century, in the latter half of the 20th century, 21st century, and then the bulk of the Muslim population live in in the third world country. In the reality of the third world country, Holland is talking about Indonesia. I can talk about South Asia. By the way, um, for your audience, um, the global Muslim population is somewhere estimated around 1.6 billion people. Uh, the largest Muslim country is Indonesia, with over 200 million Muslim people, and not in the Middle East. The three next largest Muslim countries are in South Asia, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, in terms of global population. Together, they constitute over half a billion people. The population in the Middle East, that is the Arab population of Middle East and North Africa, Con, uh, consist of less than a fifth of the population. So we need to keep these, these things into account. But the overwhelming sociological reality is that this is the third world. You know, I mean, in South Asia, the bulk of the Muslim population is living at $2 a day income. Uh, education and literacy rates are, you know, illiteracy rates are way up in the 60, 70 percentile mark, you know. And, and so, the understanding of anything, and in this term we're talking about philosophy, politics, culture, is in, at that level of, of understanding where people are still using their thumbprints to sign a check. That's one reality. 
and why Islamism has taken hold of is a reality of how petrodollar mixed with the political dysfunctionality of these Muslim countries has played a huge role to create the legitimacy of the argument that all solutions of the Muslim world, particularly the you know places like Pakistan, Egypt, <laughs> Somalia, and so on, is in Islam. That is the argument of the engineers of Islam. Then there is the reality of, of in the West, in Europe, in North America, and here you have the Boston bombers growing up in in Boston, one of the elite cities of the Western world, a place with with the most important university and educational system of the Western world. And then you have these young men going to these schools. And then you should ask the question, like the one of Ed Hussein, how do these people become Islamists? Well, they are being incubated not only within the mosque system, within their families, where the people are only speaking about their own situation, whether it's Chechnya, Pakistan, Lebanon, Palestine, disconnected with the larger reality of America as uh, the founding constitutional republic and trying to understand what it means in terms of freedom, in terms of individual responsibility, in, in terms of all that that makes a human being, not merely a Muslim, but a human being. And a Muslim is a human being, the full roundedness. And so they're living in that environment, and then there is the legitimacy of the Western arguments, particularly the center-left argument. You know, Boston is the city of Noam Chomsky. What more can I say? You know, uh, so here are these young people reading Noam Chomsky, reading Edward Said, reading Howard Zinn, reading Richard Falk, reading the whole lot of Western thinkers who have been dumping upon the culture and civilization of enlightenment. And here are these young men, highly impressionable, listening to these adults, these iconic figures of Western left intellectual world, then internalize it and say, you know, this is all legitimate. What Osama bin Laden is saying is also being said by Noam Chomsky in such a way, and they're already, some portion of that incubated numbers are ready to act out their ideology. Wow, fantastic points. Um, Holland, uh, moving back to you, I read the book that you co-authored with former Indonesian President Wahid uh, named The Illusion of the Islamic State, and that was really instrumental in pushing back ideologically against radical Islam in Indonesia. But one of the things that fascinated me when I was doing my research about the book was that this was the beginnings of what was supposed to be a movement, a civil society movement. And it was warned, I think by Wahid or perhaps by you, that this movement needed resources and it needed organization and that it would flounder if it didn't get that. Now, the Muslim American community in the United States, groups like the Council on American Islamic Relations, the Islamic Society of North America, the North American Islamic Trust, they have those resources and they have that organization that could have really promoted his book in the United States and around the world. And so my question to you is, why haven't groups in the U.S. that have been connected to the U.S. branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, like CARE, promoted the work of former Indonesian President Wahid and the work of you guys? Uh, what President Wahid, what the Muslim leaders, we deal with very, we build networks of very powerful Muslim leaders in the fields of religion, education, pop culture, government, business, and the media. <coughs> and <coughs> what all of these people recognize that work with closely with and really constitute the backbone of liberal foundation, they recognize that what is causing the terrorist attacks, whether we're talking about Madrid or we're talking about in Iraq or in <clears throat> London, in Boston, in Bali, what's causing this is not simply an individual. There always is an individual, various individual factors, the person, the family, their economic situation, their social situation, but with almost without fail, and I believe would actually be accurate to say without fail, in terms of Islamist terrorism, there is an ideological factor. And this ideological factor that is motivating Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda affiliated terrorists to commit these horrific acts is actually shared by so-called nonviolent extremists. Uh, from the perspective of President Wahid and other, what I would term spiritual ulama, spiritual intellectuals within the Muslim world, sp leaders of mass organizations, what they recognize very clearly is that the ideology and the agenda, for example, of the Muslim Brotherhood 
right, is no different from that of Al-Qaeda. It's just that they have a different methodology to achieve their objectives. And it actually, if we look from a geopolitical perspective, it can be much more dangerous uh, if Islamists are seeking to achieve the acquire the reins of power and use the repressive apparatus of the state um, when they achieve control of a particular nation state than isolated terrorists running around trying to stay alive hiding in caves. In other words, the Muslim Brotherhood has acquired some degree of power in Egypt and is much greater threat to most people in Egypt <laughs> to have the Muslim Brotherhood in power there than uh, Al Qaeda because Al Qaeda is not in power but the Muslim Muslim Brotherhood is, and the Muslim Brotherhood is seeking to change the. Not only are they seeking to it, the, as we, as your reader, your listeners, I'm sure are aware. So I think most of the people who are watching this follow these issues pretty closely. Um, you've got an extreme controversy going on in Egypt related to the Constitution. The Muslim Brotherhood is seeking to impose on everyone in Egypt <clears throat> the same type of medieval Islamic laws that Al Qaeda would do. Egypt is seeking to deny uh, Egyptian citizens who are not Muslim the right to act as full citizens of the Egyptian state. The situation that, and this is why <clears throat> organizations that come from a legacy Muslim Brotherhood or jamaat e islami the uh, Islamist organization that originated in South Asia, um, they recognize that the people who are associated with Lipfroll Foundation are not simply targeting an act, terrorism, we're targeting an ideology. <clears throat> and what we do do, we, we, we're polite, you know, I, I interact with people from all kinds of backgrounds, I travel to the Middle East, I, I meet people here, and it's always polite. And actually the leader of one of these organizations once said to me when we were together at a meeting with the Dalai Lama, we helped bring together Muslims from 30 countries to meet the Dalai Lama in San Francisco. And the leaders of one of these large organizations in America that you mentioned said to me, I read every single thing that appears on the Lip for All Foundation website. So they obviously <clears throat> recognize that we exist, um, but they have not to date uh, promoted uh, what we're doing perhaps because the understanding of Islam that we have is uh, rather different. In other words, we reject the politicization of Islam. You quoted the book, The Illusion of an Islamic State. <clears throat> President Wahid, and there were actually a, a, a large number of the top Muslim leaders in Indonesia who were behind this book. It became viral. It impacted the 2009 elections in Indonesia and derailed the political agenda of the Muslim Brotherhood affiliated political party PKS in Indonesia. It was it was that powerful in its effect. <clears throat> and what we did is we deconstructed the Islamist argument for the imposition of medieval Islamic law on contemporary societies and call instead for application of the law of compassion. Uh, which in a Christian context would refer to applying, you know, observing the spirit rather than the letter of the law because as <clears throat> many Muslims around the world have traditionally recognized the term Sharia, it appears in the Quran in reference to universal principles that are shared by all uh, religions. Universal principles, love, compassion, forgiveness, kindness, uh, <clears throat> beneficial purpose, gratitude, uh, what it, the, in the passage of time uh, after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, in the centuries after this, uh, the Arabs conquered <coughs> neighboring states, and when they conquered these neighboring states, they had to develop laws, and they had no laws, they had no system of law in the Quran. <coughs> so it was necessary to create a system of law. When they created that system of law, they looked for a term to give it to lend a halo of divinity and sanctity to this law, and they adopted the term Sharia. But in, a, in fact, <clears throat> what is often called Sharia, or invariably called Sharia by Islamists, is the interpretation of law by human beings using a process known as ijtihad, the application of, the, of human intelligence to scriptural sources. But <clears throat> the functioning of the human intelligence is human, it's not divine, it's contextual. It occurs within a certain time and place, very often under uh, con circumstances which deeply involve politics and self-interest. And so <clears throat> the ulama who are associated, the Muslim leaders associated with Lip for All Foundation and our International Institute of Chronic Studies generally refer to Islamic law by its proper term, fiqh, F-I-Q-H, which is created by human beings and can be changed. 
and they tend to apply the term Sharia to those universal principles which Islam shares with all religions and which are accepted by all humanity, all human beings who think with a healthy heart and mind. I see. Now, uh, Salim, before I go to you, I just want to tell the audience that we will be taking your questions relatively soon, so if you want to start posting them on the YouTube channel, uh, then my partners will send me the questions for consideration uh, once we're finished with this part of the interview. Now, Salim, uh, you've also had a lot to say about these groups in the United States. How have they reacted to your writing and activism? Uh, is it safe for me to assume that I won't see your book being sold at a care convention? Well, I mean, um, if you're asking me about how the members of the, uh, what Holland has correctly described as the um, legacy organizations of the Muslim Brotherhood and Jamaat Islami, the answer is very simple. We don't exist for them, and they will not acknowledge us, not acknowledge my writing, not invite people like me into uh, uh, discussions uh, in mosque and mosque-related institution. Uh, this is just an aside. Uh, the whole uh, institutionalization uh, by these organizations of interfaith dialogue with which uh, Christians and Jews engage with um, uh, these imams and, and their representatives like Care Khan and ISNA and all the various other organizations is a huge public relation exercise because they refuse to engage with Muslims or with anybody else, you know, they, they, they are engaging to, to be mainstream and acknowledge. So, uh, and, and this ironically is not properly understood in the, in the larger society, and I'm talking here about the West. But let me, if you give me a couple of minutes, let me just sure. back up what uh, uh, Holland was speaking about in, in, in another way. Um, look, um, what is happening, and, and you know, we are preoccupied that the West quite correctly, the uh, you know, United States in particular, and then its allies quite correctly is preoccupied with the events that unfolded in 9-11. But 9-11 was not a bolt from the blue. 9-11 itself incubated and gestated over a period of time, and it represents something, and what it represents was a spillover of this great conflict that is taking in the heart of the Islamic world. This is a struggle within Islam for the soul of Islam in, in, in terms of the way Judy Jasser in his book has written the battle for the soul of Islam. I'm, I'm, I'm using that metaphor. But this is a huge struggle taking place and it has been going on now for several decades. Um, we can say in, in fact over a century in, in modern history and the analogy here again within a very short time that I have, the analogy here for anybody who is a serious and want to seriously understand this and throw away all the polemics and the apologetic is to understand how Christendom, Europe, made the transition from Inquisition through Renaissance, Reformation, Counter-Reformation, Enlightenment, the wars of the European states, revolution, French revolution, the consequences of that revolution and the wars, right up to say the communist Bolshevik revolution of 1917, the two world wars. It is an immense big history. The articulation, for instance, of the Bill of Rights, the first, second, third amendments, it was written down in the Constitution after 1789 in the case of the United States. Uh -huh. But the articulation and the implementation of, for instance, simply the First Amendment has a history that stretches over a century. Look, United States is the embodiment of the ideas of enlightenment, of John Locke, of, you know, Adam Smith that took place in the 1776 revolution. And its opening statement is, all men are created equal, endowed by the creator, with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And the United States was half free and half slave. And it took another war, another century, uh, a civil war that tore America apart. That, that was the greatest and most difficult war before the black man became free. It took another century for the black man to get the vote, the civic, you know, the civic struggle that took place, Martin Luther King and so on. 
This is a long struggle, and we in the Muslim world are now caught up in this struggle. There is no magic key out there that you're going to twist it. The theological issues are the issues that we Muslims have to fight out, you know, the difference between Sharia and fiqh. In my opinion, Sharia is not only man-made, Sharia was a way to legitimize the tyrants that took Islam from what happened soon after the, the death of the Prophet. And, and this is a huge debate. The Muslims have to engage in this debate, and we are engaging in this debate in this modern context of global communication and instant communication that is taking place. And, and remember this, the largest and the most vicious attack is upon Muslims. In thousand, I am a survivor of a genocide where three million Muslims were killed by the Pakistan army and their supporters in the Jamaat e Islami. Three million Muslims killed, 10 million Muslim refugees. The battle is not over. It's not going to be over in my lifetime. Okay. Now, and, and uh, just West, if I might just conclude, the West has to understand this so that it can make a positive difference by supporting those Muslims who want to be free and want to be reconciled with the modern world. I see. Now, uh, just real quickly, one last question for me, and then we're going to go to the questions from some of the viewers. The majority of the people that are watching our webinar today are going to be non-Muslims. And so I'm going to ask each of you, starting with Holland, um, about what your message to them is. We want to know, as non-Muslims, what role can we play in helping Muslims like yourself that are waging this ideological battle? The very first issue <clears throat> is to understand, because in the absence of understanding, it's impossible to engage in effective action. I think that the purpose of the Clarion organization and you, Ryan, and what you're doing is to facilitate that understanding, but there is a spectrum of views that exist within Muslim communities. There's a spectrum of views regarding Islam. And <clears throat> just as some uh, Christians uh, believe in sainthood and the Virgin and a certain attitude towards the Virgin Mary, and there are others who think that uh, what's being done in Catholic churches is borders on idolatry. <laughs> that literally, you've got that kind of spectrum that exists within Christianity. A wide spectrum exists within the Muslim world. Muslims are not, un are not uh, monolithic, nor is Islamic theology. The understanding of Islam is quite different, held by different people. So <clears throat> it's impossible to engage in effective action to support those who oppose radical Islam without understanding the spectrum of views that exist. So that very first thing, I say two things actually. First, do no harm. Second, understand. And ultimately, with that understanding, I think it's absolutely critical, and Salim touched upon this, uh, it is critical that this understanding reach the level of uh, creating a societal consensus which would fundamentally unite what we refer to as the humanitarian left with the national security oriented right. If <clears throat> the hard left will use the accusation of Islamophobia to target anybody on the right and basically try to discredit them and use it for political purposes, the accusation for political purposes, a person who is a humanitarian leftist generally is motivated by a concern for human beings. And therefore the humanitarian leftist is more amenable to changing their position based on information. Now, <clears> the <throat> same phenomenon exists on the right. Uh, there are some people who uh, I would refer to who feel that Islam is monolithic, Islam is satanic, Islam is, uh, if you're a good Muslim, then you, if you're a good uh, Muslim, you have to be a bad person. I mean, obviously, if you, if one knows Muslims around the world, then I deal with many people uh, uh, who are, for example, evangelical working in the Muslim world, and they realize their experience being in the Muslim world is they'll have Muslims who are happy to have have this evangelical doctor pray in the name of Jesus for their well-being. And obviously this person is not a radical. This person <clears throat> is not a problem. So the more one learns and understands, the better position one is to effectively address these problems. And as I say, um, what it, one's in a better position to make decisions oneself, how to engage, but also to participate, because prior to President Wahid's death, he asked me to articulate and then begin to launch a movement uh, which could help to mobilize America and the West, in his phraseology, to help Islam.
Now, it was not Al-Qaeda's um, Al Islam who was wanting to help. <laughs> it was his understanding of Islam that he was, they need help, Muslims need help, in order to uh, escape from the tremendous oppression, intimidation, and violence that's used to enforce a monolithic discourse within the Muslim world, which tends to feed into a monolithic understanding in the West. So what we wish to avoid in the West is either the whitewashing that occurs very often on the left. For example, President Wahid, if you bear with me here just for a moment, President Wahid three times uh, said to me, Holland, I cannot deny that Osama bin Laden is a Muslim. He said to Shahada, he said the Muslim confession of faith, and I would be a hypocrite <laughs> if I denied, one, that he was a Muslim, and two, that he uses theological rationales to justify what he's doing. He does. What we have to do is acknowledge that this exists, that it's real, and then take concrete steps to defeat this phenomenon, that this virulent ideology that exists within the Muslim world and that is not new, but which actually can be traced to the very early days of Islam. And by understanding who our allies are and recognizing that there are extremely principled individuals within the Muslim world who will wish to address this threat, um, but who do not have the either the physical security in many countries or the resources that are available to the Islamists through Wahhabism um, to ally with people of goodwill of every faith and nation and ultimately bring pressure to bear on governments to adopt okay. sound policy and then implement this sound policy for the long term. Okay, now let me go to Salim with the same question, uh, if you could, just a little bit quickly so that we can get to the questions from the viewers. Well, a number of times Holland has uh, mentioned about uh, President Wahid talking about Muslim and that uh, Osama bin Laden undeniably was a Muslim. And so let me back up and say uh, uh, something about this in terms of what the Quran itself says. I mean, Muslims believe that the Quran is the word of God. So what does the Quran say? In the Quran, a Muslim is a lower ca category of a person because the Quran makes a clear distinction between a Muslim and a Mu'min. A Mu'min is a believer. And in the eyes of God, all believers are believers. There's no distinction to be made. So a Muslim has a long way to go to become a Mu'min. And the irony is, that the Islamists have made the category of Muslim and an exclusive category and uses the word of God as the Quran to claim that they are the one who are special and everybody is, is an infidel. But if you understand the hermeneutics of the Quran that I've just presented, it is the Islamists as Muslims who are the infidel. And after 9-11, ironically and quite correctly, the engagement with the Al-Qaeda, with the Taliban, that the United States-led operation in Afghanistan was a very Quranic operation because these were the people who were behaving like infidel and God says, drive the infidels out. And that's what the Americans were doing. Drive the infidels out so that the people, in this case the Afghans, can become once again free to live a life of freedom. So here is the irony, and I have written about this. For instance, the Israelis, the Jews in, in Palestine, are acting absolutely properly as Mormon. And the people who are engaged in suicide bombing against the Israelis are the infidels, irrespective of what they claim, whether they are Muslims and how many head marks that they have and how many times they have gone to Hajj. It doesn't matter because that's the, only the externality of what they're talking about. The Quran itself says a moment is to be understood by his conduct. By the way, I'll conclude this. Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, who fought Israel in three wars, let it, he slowly realized that he was acting as a Muslim and he started becoming a Mormon when he went to Jerusalem to embrace the Israelis and because he was becoming a Mormon the Islamists killed him. Now think about that. Wow. Okay, now we're going to go to a few questions from the viewers. Um, so if you could just quickly answer them so that we can go through these, um, get through all of them, that'd be great. Um, the first question that I'm going to pose to you guys is Salim and Holland, are you accepted in the mosques in your area? And we'll go to Holland for this first. Yes. <laughs> Salim? No, not in London. Because in London, which is my home, there are two mosques. And uh, 
I am a, a technically barred from those two mosques. If I go there, there would be violence. It would begin with verbal violence, and it could turn ugly. Well, let me follow up with you on that. What did you do or say that caused that break where they said, don't come here anymore? Well, I mean, it's not simply caused the break. I mean, they technically de declared me to be a heretic, if not worse, an apostate. Uh, and it was all because of my public position, my public writing, my public speaking as a Muslim and, and taking uh, my own responsibility in explaining to my compatriots what we are engaged in since 9-11. And even before 9-11. I see. Now, um, as for the U.S. and what the Western governments and their role to play in this ideological battle, uh, what should the U.S. government and even officials on the local level be doing in relation to groups that are connected to the Muslim Brotherhood, like CARE, and how should they be handling their relationship with these organizations in comparison to how they handle yours? And so we can go back to Holland for that. The very first thing that has to happen, we are so far from the federal government or Western European governments effectively addressing this matter. That's why I said <clears throat> advice one, first do no harm. <laughs> so it's just the federal government and European government ceasing to do harm would already be tremendously beneficial. <laughs> Um, second, understand. Now again, understand does not involve action. Understanding means learning. And so and then three, once that understanding exists, it needs to be institutionalized so that it can be perpetuated within government uh, positions so that if one person comes to a clear understanding of these issues, <clears throat> it's not going to be lost when they transition to another job. Once that is, the understanding exists and the institutionalization mechanisms are in place, then one can begin to look at actu developing actual concrete strategies for implementation in conjunction with prominent Muslims who have an understanding and can provide advice and have been carefully vetted and who will likewise carefully vet their partners in the West, <clears throat> then those the strategies can be implemented and then they can be fine-tuned on the basis of successive implementation. So what I'm saying here, there is no magic silver bullet that immediately you can go out tomorrow and start acting effectively because our governmental system is so broken, not only in America but in Europe and elsewhere, we are so far from people in power who are responsible for addressing the ideology because it's very, there's a very big difference in how the Western world is addressing the, viol the acts of terrorism and how they're addressing the ideology. Terrorism falls into the uh, purview of people who are engaged in hardcore action. I'm talking about SOCOM, I'm talking about the CIA in the United States uh, and so forth. You're, you're tracking these people down and you're neutralizing, eliminating them. Uh, the ideology is handed over to people in so-called civilian realm. Uh, ever since 9-11, there have been people who know nothing about Islam who are responsible for addressing the ideology. They're not addressing the ideology, and their advisors tend to come from the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Saudi-funded, and they're actually creating havoc in the decisions they're making. I'm saying not only in the United States but in Europe. Anybody who's following US policy in the Middle East right now can see that our actions are actually favoring the Muslim Brotherhood. They're not opposing the Muslim Brotherhood and this is not new. And so my answer to your your uh, your person's question is unfortunately not a silver bullet is <laughs> to be humble <laughs> and realize, I'm talking about government, what government personnel need to do. They need to first stop doing harm understand the situation through thorough study and then institutionalize this understanding. And that's why I say this isn't going to happen in the absence of creating a broad societal consensus in the West where it's actually the public that arrives at this understanding. It's the humanitarian left, the national security oriented right. There is an understanding that emerges in the public just as an understanding emerged in the 1940s that communism posed an existential threat not only to the United States but to the well-being of humanity and then eventually that was translated into long-term policy options which existed, programs which existed until the collapse of the Soviet Union in, uh, in 1992. This is a long-term process that, that, that defies easy and quick solutions. Okay, and Salim, how about you? What are your recommendations for elected officials in the United States and Canada for that matter? Well, I concur. I mean, I, I, I have been talking about it and I've written about it that, you know, we should have taken a page from George Kennan and that's what uh, Holland is referring to, that soon after the end of the Second World War, 
uh, George Kennan, the former diplomat, the great scholar of uh, Soviet communism in Russia, wrote the classic paper that eventually was translated by the, uh, President Truman into what became the Truman Doctrine, the policy of containment, and that lasted throughout the period until the collapse of the Soviet Union. We should have taken a page from there, but it requires an understanding precisely of what we are confronted with and what we have been in, in, in for the past dozen years is, is, is a denial of, of, of the reality of what we are confronting, that is global jihad, uh, because to understand global jihad we then have to point out where what is the source, what is the ideology, the mechanism by which this ideology is being spread, what is the end that this ideology seeks, and then produce a set of policy that would effectively counter it. Containment would be one of them, you know. Um, we are talking about uh, dealing with that part of the world which is the factory, the manufacturing center of this ideology. I mean, we have Saudi Arabia, we have Iran, we have their associated countries like Pakistan and Egypt now under the Muslim Brotherhood, but we have no effective policy to deal with them. And in, in reverse what we have, and this is part of the Western strain, it is not alien to the Western strain, and this is, I think, what Holland is referring to, the, the, the left uh, 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 aspect of Western uh, society uh, and thinking that is the policy of appeasement. Look, I mean, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, the West was in, in full appeasement mode of the fascist forces, except for that crazy man who was there standing and who saved it. I'm referring to Winston Churchill. We had the same thing after George Kennan and Harry Truman uh, put in the containment policy. Eventually, what happened was that policy was turned on its head into detente and coexistence, and we were in full embrace of Soviet Union until that another crazy man appeared called Ronald Reagan and who called the evil empire evil empire. And we know, I mean, we can run through that history. This is that aspect of the Western strain, and we are now seeing it in full, full bloom that that aspect of Western blame is in full appeasement mode wants to completely embrace the Muslim Brotherhood, it embraces uh, Saudi Arabia, and therefore we are at a loss in terms of how do we stand up to this global jihad. Okay, and the last question from the viewers that we're going to take today, I'm going to combine two questions into one. Uh, they're interested to know uh, your take on Quranic verses that, as it's explained by Islamists, call for killing non-Muslims, or the death penalty for apostates, people who are part of Islam and then leave the faith, or people that are just apostates um, to begin with because they're, they're atheists and don't believe in any god. And we'll go to Holland first for that uh, to explain some of those verses and the difference in interpretation that you have. Yeah, uh, I'm good friends with an Orthodox rabbi, a very prominent Orthodox rabbi, and I asked him once <clears throat> if, in his opinion, it was historically accurate that uh, the Jews were commanded when they returned to the land of Israel to kill every man, woman, and child, and the goats and cows, too. And he said, yes, but let me explain why. And we then proceeded to discuss how uh, rabbis today and Jewish people today address these verses. And obviously they're addressing them in a manner which has led to a different result when the Jewish people came to Israel and established an independent state after World War II. In other words, there's been uh, exegesis, there's been hermeneutics, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, been a contextualizing of what occurred thousands of years ago after Exodus, after the Exodus from Egypt. <clears throat> so the way that Muslim leaders affiliated with Lipfro Foundation and actually uh, spiritual Muslim leaders throughout the world, including many of the world's most prominent theologians, deal with this issue is by um, recognizing that uh, first that the events described in the Quran occurred with at a certain time and place and within certain conditions, which is impossible for human beings today to fully understand or comprehend. And for one to assume that one could select certain verses from the Quran and on a selective basis propagate hatred towards other human beings or kill other human beings is arrogating to oneself uh, the qualities of the divine, <laughs> to judge other human beings and condemn them to death, which is very un-Islamic uh, conduct from their perspective. Because they believe that Islam, the primary message of Islam is rahmatan lil alamin, to serve as a source of universal love and compassion for all creation in any act, including terrorist acts or burning of churches or beating of human beings, forcible conversion, uh, 
uh, killing people for apostasy. <laughs> um, any of these acts violate the principle of universal love and compassion. And for readers who are interested or viewers who are interested in understanding more about how Muslim theologians uh, Deal, address these issues in terms of promoting freedom of religion in the Muslim world, you may be interested in President Waheed's introduction to Nina Shea and Paul Marshall's book, Silenced How Blasphemy and Apostasy Codes Are Choking Freedom Worldwide. It was published by Oxford University Press. Uh, they asked me to coordinate with President Waheed to write an introduction, which he called God Needs No Defense. And it distinguishes between a falsely divinized human understanding of the Quran and the reality of God's will, which no human being can fully know, and certainly no human being should be so arrogant as to claim to know and, and violate uh, the rights of other human beings. So the people we work with reject those Quranic verses, re reject the use of those Quranic verses for the sake of uh, politicized violence, and likewise believe in freedom of religion. Sure. Now, Salim, uh, what's your take on some of these verses that uh, people are asking about? The verses that apparently call to kill the infidel, non-Muslims, and the death sentence for apostates. Well, it's a it's it's a large take, but here we have limited time. So let me say to you. The very struggle that we have been talking about this for past hour is ultimately on how to read the Quran, how to hear the Quran, how to understand the Quran. The analogy is very simple. I mean, where does the 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 whole struggle of modernity in Christendom begins? It begins with how to read the Bible, uh, how the Bible was read by Martin Luther, and his famous statement, "Here I stand," you know, when he was challenged and how the Bible was officially read by the Catholic Church were vastly different and that's exactly what is happening you know and it was it was bound to happen I mean here is a text which claims to be the Word of God uh, and how the Word of God is understood by fragments of human being is going to be vastly different it is I mean as I tell my students you know you have a pool of water and a swallow goes and dips his beak in it, and an elephant goes and drink out of it, and it's a two totally different capacity and understanding of how you take in the water. Now, uh, the the issue about these particular verses has to be, as as Holland has said, has to be put in context, and the and the the main context is as follows: Quran is not a text of ethnicity. It is not a text being addressed to Arabs, though it is an Arab language, no more than the first Gospels written in Greek, the Greek, Greek Bible, was an ethnic Bible for the Greek. It was the language at that time, and, 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 and the prophet is, is born among the Arabs, and he's going to speak Arabic, you know, Jesus spoke Aramaic. So language is simply the vehicle through which the particular is being of the transcendent reality is being expressed, okay? So the Quran is not an ethnic book. It is in that sense a universal book. And the Islamists read it as an ethnic book, as if they are in possession of God. I'm reminded of a famous statement, and I love it, and I use it with my students, what Rabbi Abraham Heschel used to say, that if my God is a God that cares about me and does not care about you, then my God is an idol. What the Islamists have done, they have transformed the Quran into a pagan book. The Islamists are the pagans of the modern time. Let's be very clear about this, you see. They were the pagans who killed the Prophet's family. And they are the pagans who are trying to bomb civilization. The Quran is not bombing civilization. It is the pagans who are bombing civilization who are dressed in the dress of a Muslim. And as I said, and I repeat myself, the Muslim is a lower category of a human being. It is only the first step. A Muslim, in the Arabic term, is somebody who has submitted. Submitted to what? To the authority of God without any understanding. There's the famous verse in the Quran. In fact, it is one of the last words of the Quran where the revelations is staying, is a statement of the word of God to the prophet that these people who are coming and claiming that they are an Islam, the word is Aslam, not that they are an Islam, tell them that yes, you have submitted, but faith has not entered your heart. There's a vast distance to travel between submission and faith in the heart. 
The Quran is very clear. There is no compulsion in religion. And here is the man, Ayatollah Khomeini, sitting and sending a fatwa against Salman Rushdie. Now is Ayatollah Khomeini, who is an Ayatollah, Grand Ayatollah, understand what is Islam? Well, Baba Mohyuddin, who came to America and who lived in Philadelphia, who wrote to Ayatollah Khomeini and said, since when have you arrogated the right that you speak for God? Have some humility and get down from your high chair. So here is the Grand Ayatollah, who is the Grand Ayatollah of the pagans, dressed in the dress of Muslims, of course he's a Muslim, Abdul Rahman Wahid was absolutely correct, he's a Muslim, he's in the first level of understanding. He's no more in a level of understanding or in, in, in consuming the water from the fountainhead of spiritual water as the swallow, because he has no humility. The judgment, whatever judgment is about faith is between man and God. And if you believe, that is the Muslim who claims to be a believer, believe that there is a final day of judgment on which he has to answer God, and the Prophet says he has to answer God, then where is Ayatollah Khomeini or King Abdullah of Saud, of of Saudi Arabia or the chief of Al Azhar claiming that they are going to pass a judgment on poor Salim Mansur or Salman Rushdie or anybody else. What is at stake is my belief and my answering God. So you see, the whole Quran, how it is to be understood, will vary immensely between individuals. Now the question is about authority and power and state, and that is at the political level and at the political sphere. And the Muslim world is as far away from modernity now as Columbus was from America when he got up on a ship in Genoa. He didn't know where he was headed. You see, the journey is a long and distant journey. He, he arrived in the Caribbean and thought he had arrived in India, you know. <laughs> See, that's the West Indies. Grand Ayatollah has arrived in Islam, you know, he's drinking like a swallow. <laughs> you know, he's right. ahead of the pagans. Your analogy, I think, was brilliant. That, uh, that entire uh, discussion there, Salim, was really magnificent. Yeah, that, that was a fantastic discussion. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, for those uh, that want to know more about these individuals, uh, C. Holland Taylor is from the Live for All Foundation. Salim Mansour is an author and a professor. The name of his book is Islam's Predicament, Perspectives of a Dissident Muslim. I'm Ryan Morrow, the National Security Analyst for the Clarion Project. And make sure you go to clarionproject.org, sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter so you can know about future webinars, and check out The Third Jihad, which is broadcasting for free on the website right now, and show it to your friends and family members. So until next time, thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon.